Okay, here we go. Let's talk about Piaget and Vygotsky. We're actually going to talk about a little bit more than that in this presentation, but this is the main focus, and I really want you to remember these two guys. So Piaget was Swiss, Vygotsky was Russian. They were both born in the same year, but poor Vygotsky died when he was very young, and um, they believed quite different things. They both thought deeply about the cognitive development of children, but they looked at it from very different perspectives. Piaget, he was influential in, across the whole world this whole time that he was working, but Vygotsky was kind of discovered later um, uh, later when, uh, because nobody can translated his work from Russia back when, during the Cold War, when nobody wanted to be reading Russian. Piaget really focused on children as little scientists doing their experiments with their senses on objects. And there, he was really looking at how children make sense of their outside world by operating and interacting with objects in the world. Whereas Vygotsky really focused on how children made sense of the world by interacting with other people who've already made sense of the world. So how do I think about the world? I'm going to interact with people who know more than me, and I'm going to take in what they tell me through language, through different tools of, of, of the intellect and culture. Um, let's move on. Here we have Piaget focusing on interacting with objects to facilitate learning, while Vygotsky is interacting, he sp says children interact with people to facilitate learning. Piaget says the driver of development is physical maturation itself. Your brain just gets, starts thinking differently over time. Whereas Vygotsky says development is driven by enjoying the company of others, that it's the enjoyment of others that actually drives people to develop. There's a different thought, uh, um, thinking between the two about language. Piaget says thought drives language. Vygotsky says language drives thought. What that means is, I think, with, here's, here I am, I'm Piaget, thinking that thought, first I have the thought, and then I search for the words. Whereas Vygotsky says, no way, you don't even have words. Like you like you don't even have thoughts without words, or they or they occur in a very different way. Um, and that theory is actually behind some of the idea that uh, behind infantile amnesia, that it becomes very difficult to remember when so much of our memory is based on words, and it's very difficult to remember pre-verbal experiences. Um, the use of private speech, Piaget said that. Little children in their preschool years are talking to themselves first as, as they're figuring out the word, world, and then that speech becomes social speech. Vygotsky says, nope. First you are engaging in this social speech, and then you turn that social speech and practice it in your private time. So you're sort of working through the meanings that you're gathering from the social world and sort of playing them out in your pretend world. Uh, they also think that there are different level um, relationship of biology, whereas biology for Piaget um, is all about maturing, and as the physiology matures, the quality of thought changes. Whereas Vygotsky said, nope, all of these functions, the elementary functions of learning are always there. You're born with them, and they're continuously functioning. The, the processes themselves don't change a lot. It's just the quality of then what you're able to use and learn changes drastically as you accumulate more learning. Um, I will talk about some of the primary processes uh, shortly. Um, here's a video of Piaget talking about his philosophy that underlies his theory. Both Piaget and Vygotsky believe that knowledge is constructed. Um, I'm going to talk about this in more detail. What do we mean by constructed? It means that it's the idea that there's nothing that we know that was out there waiting to be known. It's that we actually construct what we know through our experiences of encountering different things. So let's go over. I've got a couple of slides of 
Piaget's core concepts. What is an operation? So much of um, Piaget's stages have the word operational in them. Like, for example, the stage for the two to seven age frame is um, the pre-operational stage. This means it's ha all of the way, the way of thinking during the stage is not yet organized, formal, logical, mental processes. That's going to come later. This is use the beginning of the use of symbolic function. So you're just now becoming able to use symbols. And what is symbolic function? It's like being able to think of a thing if you can't touch the thing. Maybe you saw the video of the baby in the coconut, and when the baby couldn't see the, couldn't see the cucumber under the coconut, the baby thought the, that it wasn't there. It was just like gone. Um, symbolic function is being able to go, aha, I have an idea of a cucumber, and somebody can put it under a coconut. And that idea of the thing can continue not only under the coconut, but I can now cast it back in my memory. I can cast forward and imagine eating a cucumber next week. I can think about a cucumber in the next room. So symbolic thought is I have either a word or a mental image for the thing, and I can manipulate it enough in my mind that I can, form, that I can begin to form operations using this image of the, of the object. Um, the centration is an idea where one aspect of a stimulus is focused on by children in this age group and other aspects are not. Um, I'm going to show you a video of conservation and I'm going to uh, also show you a video of how egocentric thought is measured. Um, and so I'm just going to move forward into that and I think I can do it. I think I can do it. When you look at these two glasses, do you think that they have the same amount of juice? Do you think they have the same? Okay. Now we're going to pour this juice into this glass. Now, do you think that this glass has more juice? This glass has more juice? Or do you think that they have the same amount? That one has more. This one has more? And why do you think that this one has more? Because the, it's taller. Now they're going to do it with an older girl. First, we're going to look at these two cups right here. Do you think there's the same amount of juice in this glass as there is in that glass? There you go. Okay. So we're going to take the juice from this glass and pour it into this one right here. So do you think that there's more juice in this glass, more juice in this glass, or do you think that they have the same amount? Same amount. Okay, why do you think that they have the same amount? Just because this is skinny doesn't mean it, it, it doesn't, it's not the same amount. It, it has the same amount of juice in it, but it, this one is just wider and this one's skinnier, but it has the same amount. Okay, so now I'm going to stop that. I'm going to exit the full screen. I want to make sure that that is totally stopped. And then I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to say a few things about this video. It was very interesting to see how, as she was saying, as she was reasoning out whether or not they had the same amount, she picked up this glass again. And she said, there, there was almost like you could see the logic because she knew that it couldn't have magically changed amounts. So she, and then she then reasoned, oh, it must look taller because it's skinnier. And if you remember the first little girl, she said, why, why is this bigger? Because it's taller. And so that's an example of a, of a sort of mm, naive uh, sense of, of the rules of the world, because in the in the when you're just a little kid the the taller the thing the bigger the thing and so anyway this is how, this is an example of conservation and how younger children aren't able to reason their way through to the fact that this taller glass is actually the same amount of liquid and now here's an a, a video that shows how they measure egocentric thought it's also pretty short and i'm going to play it now 
same thing. Can you tell me what you see when you look at it from that stool? An owl? What what's what is that? A goat. Okay, is there anything else you see? Right there, what is that? A tree. A tree. Another little tree. Okay. And can you tell me what I see when I look at this from where I'm sitting right here? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a little kid. Okay, so can you tell me what you see from Here's that? Here's an older kid. Mm. Now, Braxton, can you tell me what I see from where I'm sitting? A bird and a river and a volcano and a horse and a rock and a bee. So let me just cancel that. Let me get out of here. And let me just tell you that the older boy was able to imagine what the what the um the researcher could see because he'd been sitting there over prior and he knew what was on that other side. So he's imagining the view from the researcher's perspective. But the little kid couldn't imagine that the researcher couldn't see what the little kid was seeing. And so this is what, this is an example of egocentric thought from Piaget's perspective. Um, okay. And then there's one more thing. Does this fit with Piaget? Not especially, but I'm going to play it for you anyway, because it talks about um, this idea of being able to see uh, from someone else's to perspective, to imagine that their experience or their uh, understanding is based on something different than your own. And so I'm going to play this. It's, it's a test of false belief and often used to, I'm gonna make the Argentine cemetery steak. to determine, it's, I'll, I'll show you. Parenting skills were to blame, but scientists suggest that understanding other minds is a skill that may not be fully developed until a child is about four. To learn how children's social skills evolve between about three and four, Researchers use something called a false belief test. What do you think's in this box? It looks fairly obvious, doesn't it? Crayon. But let me show you. I filled it full of candles. All right, now I close it up again. While you and I have been having this conversation, Snoopy has been down here asleep. Doesn't know what we've talked about. But let's bring him into the conversation. Now I have another question for you. What do you think Snoopy will say if I ask him what's in this box? Crayon, obviously. What else could anybody possibly say? Well, watch this three-year-old. What do you think is inside this box? Let's open it up and see. Candles. Now, you can ask the child what appears to be a very simple question about that. What did you think was inside the box when you first saw it? They say, oh, I always thought that there were candles in this box. Then you can ask them about someone else. So you can ask them about Snoopy. Snoopy's been sitting here. He hasn't seen this box. He's never seen us open it up. What does Snoopy think is inside this box? Uh, candles. Children say the same thing. Snoopy will think there are candles inside this box. What that indicates is that the children's view of how minds work is very, very different from the view that you and I would have. Did you see it? In the mind of the three-year-old, everyone sees the world much the same way. There's okay, so that gives you the sense of how people, um, how researchers measure the false belief test. Like, and so there's this shift that happens um, between three and four, which is the age group we're studying, where they begin to realize that another person is going to see something in a different way based on that person's either experience or predicted expectations 
or even a built viewpoint. All right. So now getting into Vygotsky, I'm not going to show you this either, although it's really interesting and I do encourage you to go back and look at it um, because it summarizes some of these core principles and sort of shows you um, a, a, a teacher interacting with a child using some of the principles of Vygotsky's thinking. So if you're especially interested in it, it's worth it. But let's go through some of Vygotsky's core concepts. Elementary mental functions are attention, sensation, perception, memory. These are innate and continuous processes. Attention, sensation, perception, and memory, they don't change. They're the raw materials with which the human being develops ever-increasing understanding of the world. Another um, concept that Vygotsky is largely, this is usually what everybody associates Vygotsky with, is the zone of proximal development. Proximal means near. Um, this is, the, the understanding of what this is, is the level at which a child can almost understand or perform a task without assistance. So, essentially, this is the level of what a child can do given their own ability. This is the level of what a child can, can't do at all. And then this is the level of what a child can do with help from somebody with more experience. And this level here, the between what the child can't do, can't, um, can do easily and what the child can't do at all, this is the zone of proximal development. So now you know. Another core concept for Vygotsky is the idea of cultural tools. So we think, but we're not just thinkers. We're thinkers that use the tools. So we have these elementary functions, attention, sensation, perception, and memory. But then we get to use the cultural tools that actually uh, human beings have developed over time. Remember, we talked at the beginning of our class about how human beings develop culture in order to better survive in their, in their worlds. So then we have these cultural tools, which are bits and pieces of knowledge and bits and pieces of ways of gathering knowledge, such as language, signs, symbols, books, software. Another really important core concept when you think of Vygotsky and his um, approach to cognitive development is this sense that there is a more knowledgeable other. Human beings aren't born into the wild. We don't, we're not wild children that live out in the woods. We are born into families and into villages and in with other people. And there's always a more knowledgeable other. And that's somebody with a greater understanding or ability than the learner. It could be the parent. It could be an older sister. It could be a neighbor. And then another really important idea that was based on Vygotsky's concepts is the idea of scaffolding, which was actually introduced in the 70s by people who were turned on to Vygotsky. And that's when a more knowledgeable other structures a task or learning such that the learner can achieve it on their own. So remember, we have like, this is what they can do easily. This is what they can't do at all. The more knowledgeable other can structure the tasks so that they're just so they can just do it on their own. Um, and in some ways, my reading guides that I make you do when you do your reading is a scaffold for those of you who are new to being in college. When I do my grad school reading, nobody gives me a reading guide, but what I do know is that when I'm doing this reading, I need to collect the salient points, pull them together, and have them handy so I have a sense of what the most important thing was said in everything that I read. So my giving you these reading guides is essentially a scaffold for the type of reading that you're going to do as you continue your college career. See? Bet you didn't know I thought that way. but Oh. This is just another characteristic of the preschool um, mindset. And I really love it, and we're going to watch it. 
because one of the things that happens, so this is a Vygotskyan phenomenon. This, this is how little kids get into this phase. It lasts, I don't know how long it lasts. Maybe I should look it up. It doesn't last forever, but where they ask why, 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 again and again and again. And the thing about that asking why, it's particularly Vygotskyan because you can't use your senses or your logic to ask why. You're asking another person. You're at, it's assuming that there's a more knowledgeable other that's going to give you an example. And the minute that you get language as a, person, as a human being, and you realize the power of being able to ask why, and then being able to get an answer that is at least somewhat satisfactory, you're now like a vacuum cleaner sucking in knowledge from the world by asking this question why. So let's go look at it. I'm gonna see. This is one mom who just recorded her daughter's uh, multiple asking why in one given day. She's two years old. Get up, girl. Why? It's daytime. Not daytime, it's uptime. <laughs> yeah, it's uptime. You've got to brush your teeth. Why? Because you have morning breath. Why? Why, Why what? No, no, kids can't have coffee. Why? Because coffee is for big people. Why? Because um, little kids can't drink it. It makes you too hyper. No. Why? SoundCloud? Yeah. Why? Because we're going to a sand park and I don't want you to get sand in your butt. Sand on my butt? Yeah. Why? And don't we can get dirty? Nope. Why? You my mommy? Yeah. We gotta go potty before we go outside, okay? Why? Because if not, you're gonna go pee pee in the car. I'm not driving. Why? <laughs> because Mama's driving. Why Mama's driving? Why don't look like Daddy's house? It's the same color like Daddy's house. Why? Because the the building is red. Why building is red? Um, because it's made of bricks. Why made of bricks? Um, because bricks hold up well and they don't fall we're gonna leave soon okay because we've been here for a long time and it goes on but i just love this girl and i love this mom uh she's so patient but like this gives you some of you if you raise a child you know that a lot of children just go through I don't know, a couple months of just this, why, why, why? But she just did such a good job of editing and capturing how often this happens all throughout the day. And, and really, so seeing a video like this is, is to me, it's like nice anecdotal evidence of Vygotskyan's worldview. Like, why, why is she asking why if there isn't a more knowledgeable other there to help her learn? Okay, let's talk a little bit about information processing. Um, when you look at the core concepts of information processing, it's just, um, uh, uh, it involves the processes that are present in birth and continuously developing. Um, they look at encoding, storing, and retrieving information. And this one, I guess we're not going to watch it, but again, I like it. I like this as an example of showing the mo how the mother is helping this younger girl learn to count. Um, well, maybe we're going to watch it anyway. What the hell? Heck. Because it's really interesting, and it doesn't last long. So this is a game that you can play. And this is an idea of if you wanted to um, really engage. Remember the counting game that we do? Whoever has the car will count. So once you drive the car to the other person, the other person needs to come to me. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. 
And so this is just a super fun game, and it's a way of interacting with. You want to come back I'm gonna escape out of this. Okay, it's a really fun way to. Um, you know, it's just an example of of how you're actually engaging in in the different levels. And well, another thing I like about this video is you can see how the mother is interacting with the younger child and the older child. You're, she's teaching like the social conventions of turn taking to the older child and she's letting the little girl act as if she knows how to count to 26 and 27 but the little girl doesn't know but she's having a great time acting as if she does and the mother isn't stopping telling the little girl you don't know she's just letting her come along for the ride so this I thought was a um, one among many lovely examples of the way that parents interact with their children to just have them have fun while learning. Um, something just to think about in terms of the um, cognitive development of preschool children is that there's autobiographical recall differences. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I know that some of the people in the class are particularly interested in cultural differences. And there are some interesting ones. For example, um, there's they've done research when they ask people, uh, Chinese people and European Americans, to think about their early childhood memories. The those in China are more likely to think of memories that involve social roles. Interesting. Also, there's the idea that memories are structured by scripts. So we may think about the order which things usually go. So if you want to say, well, what did you do yesterday morning? You'll think, well, I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I put on deodorant, I didn't get out of my pajamas because it's COVID-19. So you may think through the script of the normal ordering of events. And another thing to, con um, to be aware of, uh, and we read about this in our book, is to be... Uh, aware that it's pretty easy to implant false memories into children of this age. They have difficulty determining the difference between fantasy and reality, and if it's vividly pictured, it may be remembered as if it were real. So there's a few tips that can be done if you want to avoid planting a false memory in a child this age. You can play dumb. You can say, tell me more about that. I don't understand. Can you explain that in more detail? You can ask follow-up questions. You can ask for the events to be described, and then what happened, and then what happened. You want to avoid making suggestions. Definitely avoid a rewarding or punishing reaction. So, like, wow, that's fascinating. This might be too much because it could encourage them to go on a line that may or may not even be true. So you want to stay neutral in your responses. 